Today I want to speak about a very well-known piece of scripture from John 15 about the vine and the branches. But upon reading this uh, recently um, I noticed something that um, I overlooked actually before and I know also from comments uh, that I've read in the past uh, or sermons that I've heard that um, many overlook this and so there is a very uh, interesting to say the least uh, fact in there. Um, so I want to read first um, verse 1 and 2 and verse 5 and later on I will also point to some other verses from this um, piece of scripture. So John 15 verse 1 um, Jesus says I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit he taketh away and every branch that beareth fruit he purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. And then verse 5 I am the vine you are the branches he that abideth in me and I in him the same bringeth forth much fruit for without me you can do nothing. So first of all uh, in order to understand this um, uh, illustration we need to understand um, yeah, the different um, persons and uh, items that are mentioned here and actually it's self-explanatory so uh, we don't need to speculate about it. First of all he, Jesus begins by saying I am the vine. So the vine that's Jesus. Now naturally a vine is a long trailing branch that uh, crawls up a fence or a wall. Um, that's naturally um, and we see it here actually quite a lot along roads and uh, in gardens. Um, but in the vineyard the vine is kept short and uh, usually at a height of about uh, four, 40 inches, eh, one meter. Uh, the end of the vine is a large uh, gnarl, uh, thick uh, end and from there uh, the branches grow. And they grow usually, at least in the vineyard, they grow, uh, they grow uh, on supports or along lines um, that supports them. And, um, from there of course the fruit will grow. So the vine that's you could say like the stem of the of the the plant uh, that is um, that is Jesus that represents Jesus. Then he says my father is the husbandman so God the father is the vine dresser and the vine dresser is the keeper of the vineyard. Uh, he is the one who cultivates each branch so that it will bear as much fruit as possible. And then um, in uh, verse 5 Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. So uh, the members of God's church, uh, they are the branches. And this is really representing um, the spiritual Israel, the, the true church, um, um, the, as opposed to, to um, the national Israel or the geographical Israel, which are represented by uh, the fig tree and the olive tree. Um, I go deeper in these three different um, 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 kinds of Israel, if you will, uh, these, these, these three different trees in a separate video, I will link it up here. Um, I would suggest that uh, you look into that because it's nice uh, or nice. It's good to uh, to understand the difference between these three, uh, as these uh, metaphors are used quite a lot of times in scripture, and they um, yeah they apply everywhere when you see this in scripture, both Old and New Testament. So the branches are the vine dressers' main focus, because that is where the fruit grows. They produce the fruit and they also need most of the, the care actually. They must be carefully tended. Now we have to read a bit more careful here to see that there are four types of branches. But there are four types. In verse 1 Jesus speaks of 
branches that bear no fruit. He speaks of branches that bear fruit. And he speaks of branches that bear more fruit. And then in verse 5 he speaks of branches that bear much fruit. So we have these four distinguished types of branches. No fruit, fruit, more fruit and much fruit. So that brings us to the fruit. What is the fruit? And that's not specifically mentioned here. So we have to go to other scriptures to find what is the fruit that we, the branches, are to bear. So uh, there are many verses actually, but I will pick out two. One from Titus, uh, chapter 3, verse 14. There it says, And let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses, that they be not unfruitful. So unfruitfulness, or rather fruitfulness, is here linked uh, to um, doing good works. Uh, works are the fruit. Works are the fruit. Now, I know by saying this, um, many alarm bells might begin to ring. Ah, so we have to do works and all this. Um, and I'll get to that a bit deeper, and Lord willing, also next, uh, next week. But um, fruit is the result. It's not something you do in order to grow or in order to, to earn something. It's the result. So um, we should keep that in mind. I'll get back to that. The second verse that um, uh, tells us this is from Colossians chapter 1, verse 10. There it says, That you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. So here again, fruitfulness is linked to good work, being fruitful in every good work. <clears throat> Fruit represents good works. It represents godly living, uh, holiness. Fruit is actually our testimony. And if we are not displaying this, if we are not producing fruit, um, then um, we are the branches that are mentioned here in verse 1 that are not producing fruit. Fruit is the evidence. It's the evidence, the result of what is inside a person. Uh, James writes that uh, faith without works is dead. Uh, so again, he also he doesn't say you need to do works in order to earn your salvation or anything, but he says if you have faith, then there will be fruit. There must be result of that. There must be evidence of that. John the Baptist uh, tells the Pharisees and the Sadducees to bear fruits worthy of their repentance. Of their repentance, it's the same thing. It's the evidence of the repentance. If you truly repent it, it must come out somehow. It must be visible. And so that's evidence, the testimony of it. Fruit or good works are evidence. And that's actually the best way and the most correct way to, to think of it. It's evidence and evidence is a testimony. So what happens when there is no fruit? And here is where most um, go wrong. Um, and I have also uh, in the past thought differently because if you read verse 1, you say every branch that uh, in me that bear no fruit, he take it away. So Jesus says the branch in me that bears no fruit, he, the Father, takes it away. And that's the King James translation. <clears throat> uh, other translations says, uh, say even he cuts it away. So you will think that these branches are removed and then thrown away. But the question is, is that really so? So if we go back to what we established before, that there are four types of branches, those that have no fruit, those that have fruit, those that have more fruit, and those that have much fruit, then you see that there is a progression from nothing to much. And so it begins always with branches that have no fruit. Uh, so if you would cut those away, then of course you would never get to branches with much fruit. You would have actually be left without branches. So it must be something else there. Now the word that is translated here by 
by taking away every branch uh, that bears no fruit, he, the Father, takes away. The word takes away, it's one word uh, in, um, in Greek, and I will uh, write it down. It's uh, ero. It's written like this. Ero. And it actually means, literally, um, to raise to raise or to take up or to lift up so it's not take away but it is lift up and that makes much sense from the perspective of um, a vineyard and a vine dresser uh, this is what it would mean there is um, a book called the secrets of the vine by dr bruce wilkinson and um, it says there, and I quote, new branches have the natural tendency to trail down and grow along the ground, but they don't bear fruit down there. When branches grow along the ground, the leaves get coated in dust, and when it rains, they get muddy and mildewed. The branch becomes sick and useless, end quote. And <clears throat> this actually complements to the, the image that Jesus used here of us being the branches. Yeah, so the, the natural tendency of the branches is to go down. I also uh, try to um, portray this in this uh, picture that I drew. Uh, branches want to go down and on, on, the, on the ground where they get dirty. And um, yeah, is this not our natural tendency also as human beings? to con conform to this world, to go down, as it were, to this word, world and get dirty and, and eventually sick and useless because we cannot bear fruit that way. So what does the vine dresser do with those branches? They are way too valuable to just cut away. And so he doesn't do that. The vine dresser goes through the vineyard with a bucket of, with water and he looks for those branches and when he finds them he lifts them up, that's the word arrow, he lifts them up and he washes them and he binds them to, to the, the trellis or to the supports whatever uh, is available there um, and then soon enough they will begin to produce fruit and they will become thriving. Now are we not much more of much more valuable to God than um, the branches to the vine dresser? I would uh, think so. Uh, in John 3 16 uh, it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We are so valuable to us. He does not just cut off cut us off and, and destroy us, uh, in his grace um, he lifts us up, he, he ero, or eri, I should say, eh? or theos eri, mas, he lifts us up. So, also we should notice that the branches cannot lift themselves up, they just go down and that's what it is. They have to be lifted up by the vine dresser. So uh, in this case, the father is the one who who tends, yeah? as Jesus says, he draws us up. It's the father who lifts up, and then it's the son in which we abide who feeds the branches. And so you see also the synergy of the Godhead here. God want to wants to restore rather than to just dismiss or destroy. But you can also imagine that if a branch stays in the dirt too long, it will begin to rot. And uh, then at some point it becomes useless forever. It dies. Um, this is also what would happen to us if we stay in the world too long. If we conform to it and um, we get sick and we we actually become spiritually dead and completely dead eventually. Now you would say yes, but it says there that there are branches that are thrown into the fire. Uh, <clears throat> and that's actually the confusing part because we usually read this whole section and then we have a certain perception. 
in verse 6 it says, or Jesus rather says, If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. So here he speaks um, not so much of a branch, but of a man. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch. So, yes, there are branches that are cut off and that are being thrown into the fire. But what is the reason? What is the reason why they are being thrown in the fire? Is it because they don't bear fruit? No. We already learned from verse 1 what God does with those that don't bear fruit. The reason here is very obvious, actually, once you see it. If a man abide not in me. So those branches, branches that do not abide in the vine, those are being cut off and thrown into the fire. So not the fact that they don't bear fruit, but the fact that they don't abide in the vine, in Jesus. And the result of that, by the way, is that they won't bear fruit. Because you can't bear fruit if you don't abide in Jesus. He is the, the lifeline. He feeds the branches. The vine feeds the branches. So if the branch does not abide in the vine, it cannot um, produce fruit. And therefore it cannot produce evidence of abiding in, in the Lord. So the evidence again, in this case the non, the absence of, of evidence, the non-bearing of fruit, that's, that's uh, the result again, it's the result. So how does the vine dresser lift us up when we are not producing fruit? How does he do that? And for that uh, I want to read from Hebrews 12 verses 5 and 6. And it says there, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise thou not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Here, the picture is uh, given of a father and a son, or a parent and a child. And we see that there, uh, the child is disciplined. And this is actually what the lifting up is. It's disciplining. Eh? Not to follow the natural tendency, but to, to follow what God um, asks um, to obey. So it's very simple, similar, this, this um, intervention uh, is very similar to that of the vine dresser. Um, the parent will try to correct the child so that it, it, it can be uh, yeah, productive. Uh, it's to the benefit of the child, of course. So from these verses here in Hebrews, we find three um, forms of uh, three degrees you can say of discipline and the first is rebuke now rebuke is a, a strong verbal warning sometimes not even verbal sometimes it's enough for a parent to look with a stern look at the child and the child will know uh, better not continue here because it's not gonna gonna work out uh, well um, so God also rebukes us um, by convicting our consciences through different ways. It can be through a word in the Bible that we read in the Bible. It can be through a sermon that we hear or a word from a fellow Christian. Um, there are different ways in which God may convict our consciences and we know that uh, we are on the wrong path or we have a wrong position on something and we should change. That's the mildest form, a rebuke. Now, um, if a child, if a parent says to a child, don't do this, that's a rebuke. And if the child continues, then um, the discipline has to, to be stepped up a, a degree. And we come into chastening. That's also what we read here in Hebrews. So, um, a chastening means limiting, restricting the privileges, the activities. That's what it actually means. Uh, 
So if, uh, if you think of a parent-child, a child may be sent to, um, to his room uh, for a certain time or uh, well, I'm from the generation where uh, you had to stand uh, in the corner for 15 minutes or so, depending on the, on the severity. It was longer or shorter. You had to just stand in the corner with your hands on your back and then uh, yeah, this, uh, after a half a minute you, uh, you didn't like this anymore. So this usually made quite an impression, at least for a while. So that's chastening. And so we can also experience chastening in our lives in different ways. It can be purely on a spiritual level, but often enough it's also on a practical level. We may, we may find increased pressure in our work or, uh, or at home or um, on our health even or finances, things like that. We, we feel uh, anxiety, we feel uh, the frustration, distress, we know something's not good. We have to change our ways um, one way or another and so we will seek the Lord and ask of Him to show us what's, uh, what, what needs to be done if we don't already know. That's chastening. And then the third level uh, that we also read here in um, Hebrews 12 is scorching. Scorching, this means physical punishment with blows. And of course, this uh, in previous generations, this was actually uh, quite normal um, to uh, maybe um, give a child a corrective uh, slap or uh, paddling. Uh, now, uh, nowadays, uh, yeah, you cannot say these things. You will be sued uh, by the child. But okay. <clears throat> you see what comes from that. Um, but anyway, it is, it is um, physical um, punishment. It causes pain, but obviously without injury. So when God scorches us, it's um, the, the same things that I mentioned with the chastening, but now they are intensified. So instead of maybe just problems at your work, you might lose your job or... Um, yeah, you might uh, get uh, sick, eh? your health gets uh, really um, compromised, not just sick, but maybe deadly ill. Um, there can be uh, bankruptcy, things li like that. So this is really scorching. Um, it's really disrupting our, our lives uh, in, a, in a big way. Um, it is godly discipline. And um, it is uh, the vine dresser lifting us up arrow. He's washing us off and we will be put in the right position so that we can produce fruit again. And yeah, from these examples you see that this can be actually a painful process. It often is. So now what about the other branches that I mentioned in uh, John 15 in verse 2? So these are the branches eh, that we just mentioned now that do not produce fruit. But what with those that do produce fruit? He says that they are being purged. Uh, that means pruned. Uh, in other words, part is being cut off and cutting hurts. And so it may seem like punishment, but it's not. It's just like, um, it's, it's similar to the lifting up, but there's also a difference. And the difference is, uh, is, is uh, f yeah, obviously, mainly, it's in the reason why. The lifting up is because no fruit is produced. The pruning is because fruit is produced. The purpose of the lifting up is to begin producing fruit. The purpose of the pruning is to produce more fruit. Um, so pruning happens because we are fruitful. And so we allow God to work with us so that he may produce more more fruit through us or we may show more evidence of our, our faith. And a good example of uh, pruning is, is the story of Job. It says in chapter 1 of uh, Job that um, he was uh, an upright man. There was no one like him in all the earth. And so uh, he was certainly not someone who was not producing fruit, who did not show evidence of this. But there needed to be done some pruning that he might um, 
produce more fruit. And so uh, God allowed Satan to, uh, to do the pruning, so to speak. Uh, and God put him uh, through great loss, through great misery, sickness, with the end result that his yield was increased. So from the outside, and maybe another one might judge it this way, it looks like, like scourging. Um, but you see that uh, it's a totally different thing. So we have to also be careful to judge people from a distance. Uh, if we see that uh, things happen to them in their lives, bad things happen, that we say, oh, they must be full of sins. Uh, and that's the reason why. Uh, it might also be that they are actually upright men like Job was, but that God is pruning them. Now, all of this has to do with producing fruit producing and producing more fruit. So why is this fruit bearing so important? What's with that? And Jesus also explains that in John 15, in verse 8. He says, Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. This is the purpose of bearing fruit, that the Father is glorified. And that we are Jesus' disciples. We cannot be Jesus' disciples without producing fruit, without evidence of our faith. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a double uh, purpose, you can say. The evidence of our faith, the testimony of our faith, glorifies the Father. Again, look at a child and a parent. The, the evidence of the love of the child for the, its parents glorifies the parents. And conversely, if there's no evidence of any love from the child towards the parents, then the parents are disappointed. It will make them sad. So, as this verse, uh, John 15 verse 8, implies, uh, the fruit-bearing is part of our discipleship. It's the result of abiding in Jesus, eh? as opposed to those in verse 6 that do not abide in Jesus. They are being cut off and thrown into the fire. But if we abide in Jesus, then um, we bear fruit. There, this is the result. It's not something we do to gain anything, to earn anything, but it is the result. And it's an inevitable result. You cannot abide in Jesus and not bear fruit. That's simply impossible. You will bear fruit. We have a perfect vine dresser, and so this uh, is um, without any doubt. In fact, God um, determined beforehand for each branch, for each one of us, which fruit we should bear. And we can read that uh, also in John 15, in verse 16. Um, there Jesus says, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. So here you see the whole, whole dynamic is, uh, is changed. It's not that we decide, ah, we want to become branches, let's plug into the vine and uh, start to produce fruit. No, he chose us. He chose us and it's the vine dresser who lifts us up and to, to, um, to tend, who tends us that we will produce fruit. And in Ephesians 2 verse 10, Paul writes, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. And you can just replace this with fruit, eh? For, to produce good uh, fruit, which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. God knows beforehand which fruit he wants us to produce, and he tends us in that way that we will if only we abide in Jesus. God gave us talents. He gave us, gave us everything that we need in order to produce the fruit that he prepared. And he is not just going to cut off a branch that fails. That branch is way too valuable for him. He will take care of it um, with great love. And um, if we abide in Jesus, in the vine, then we will produce fruit. We must produce fruit, but we, there is no other way. And it will be the right fruit. 
God has done his part, so to speak, by lifting us up, by tending us, by making sure that we are um, connected to him through the vine, through Jesus. Therefore, we are uh, fed the right food and um, it's up to us to stay in Jesus, to stay, uh, to remain uh, abiding in him. Um, that is what it is. That is what it means. That is what Jesus says in John 15 verse 6, uh, to abide in him. If we do so always and continually, then we produce fruit. There is uh, nothing, uh, nothing else to it. It's simply the result. If we don't abide in him, and this is our part. Our part is not to produce fruit. Our part is to abide in him. Again, the fruit is the result. It's the evidence. If we do not abide in him, then we will be cut off and thrown into the fire. This is, this is what, we, what we need to do. Um, recognize his love and uh, answer his love by accepting um, the gift of grace in Jesus and abide in him. And then we will find out, each one individually, what God expects from us um, in our corner of the vineyard. Amen. Mm -hmm.